Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kevin Hawkins from the University of North Texas, and I am going to moderate uh, uh, this morning's panel on educating and supporting editors in library publishing programs. Uh, on our panel are uh, Allegra Swift from the Claremont Colleges, uh, Isa Gilman from Pacific University, Melanie Schlosser from The Ohio State University, and Karen Devinney, uh, my colleague at the University of North Texas. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a sort of brief uh, opening statements, five, ten minutes um, from each of the, uh, the presenters. Uh, we'll kind of turn to you to ask you to, to comment and sort of respond to, to some things we've said and then uh, open it up for, for a discussion here. And I'll be, uh, you know, coming around with, uh, with the microphone for that. So um, we really look forward to it. Uh, so first up are uh, Isaac and Allegra. Uh, so, Allegra and I are working in kind of very similar contexts. We both work at smaller institutions uh, with small library publishing programs with faculty edited journals. And even though, uh, even though these editors have very strong disciplinary expertise and are often have very accomplished records of scholarship, we found that they don't always have a good idea of the broader context for the issues uh, that go into making a scholarly journal successful. And so, our, uh, our goal in creating this workshop is to try and provide some education for the editors at our institutions um, around three areas that we think are really key to journal success. The first being quality, the second being impact, and the third being sustainability. And uh, we, we figured out that a QIS is actually a valid Scrabble word, so that's a, that's a way that you can remember this, and also a win at Scrabble. Uh, and so we wanted to identify ways that we could uh, educate faculty in these areas and also work with them to help improve their journals. So with regard to quality, we felt that it was really important for OA journals to address uh, the factors that influence both the perceived and the actual quality uh, of the journals. Um, with regards to impact, we hope to encourage um, practices that would increase engagement from both authors and readers uh, with these journals. And then finally, with sustainability, we wanted to ensure that the journals we were publishing and their editors were set up to be successful over the long term and not just be high quality and have high impact for one year. Um, and while we initially created this workshop to try and address needs at our own institutions, we hope that the framework that we're providing will, will be uh, helpful or useful um, for anyone else in another institution that is working directly with journal editors. So first I want to talk a little bit about quality. And uh, the first aspect of quality that we wanted to address had to do with perceived quality. And rightly or wrongly, uh, the appearance of open access journals has become a proxy for the quality of these journals. Um, and readers and authors want quick ways to try and determine whether a journal is high quality. Uh, and in part, this is due to the um, popularity in some quarters of, uh, of Beale's list. Uh, but we also see it in, uh, in relation to library instruction classes and information literacy. Um, a common question that we teach to and that we get from students is how do you tell if a journal or an article is peer-reviewed? What, what's the quickest way we can tell? And so a lot of it has to do with appearance. Uh, in response to issues with uh, predatory open access journals, uh, there have been some efforts within the open access publishing community to uh, try and provide some external indicator of quality. And one of the most prominent efforts um, that we're probably all aware of in recent, recent years has been the expansion and refinement of the DOAJ inclusion criteria and their creation of this new uh, SEAL program. Uh, which gives us another external marker to indicate quality. But obviously we, we don't want our authors to just create journals that look like they're high quality and then be cruddy underneath. Uh, we, want, we want journals that are actually high quality. And so in order to do that, um, it's important to have policies and procedures in place, and not just in place, but have policies and procedures in place that are enforced uh, that will help improve the quality of the journal, whether that's for peer review uh, for dealing with uh, questions around research ethics, um, for conflicts of interest, all those sorts of things. Uh, and so we hope that, that when, when that happens, when a journal has better policies and procedures, and when those policies and procedures are followed, that it will lead to improved quality of the published work, but also an improved experience for authors and improved experience for readers. Uh, and we hope that in turn, uh, that improved quality will lead to improved impact for uh, journals. Okay, so how do you convey quality? Um, traditionally, the jur journal impact factor is uh, seen as having, is one way of determining quality, as we all know, and uh, journals with high impact factor are seen as having influence on the discipline. 
Um, for open access journal, especially a new open access journal, this marker of quality, this visibility in the field is necessary to engage potential authors, reviewers, um, get influential board members, but uh, in fact, factor is not always a useful measure. As Martin Eve mentioned yesterday, traditional methods of determining impact don't always correlate with quality. So many times in terms of uh, tenure and promotion, brand name publishers and journals are being used as a proxy for quality. So for newer journals, OA, humanities, or interdisciplinary journals, newer models of evaluating evaluating impacts such as alt metrics are becoming increasingly important and can even supplement uh, the information gained from these traditional impact metrics. So ultimately, you want readers to discover, read and cite your content. You want experts in the field to participate as reviewers or on editorial boards. And so more interaction equals more impact and more impact equals more interaction. But having a high impact factor or altmetric scores is pointless unless you can't, can't sustain the journal um, if it folds because actors, uh, editors can't keep up or are burned out or there's no succession plan. Um, there's really no point in having a high impact factor. So library publishing programs need to make sure that the journals and the editors are set up to succeed and be sustainable. So what's needed to sustain a journal? There's a Start out with a strong foundation that can build impact and grow the cycle of submissions and readership. You need a plan for marketing and keeping the journal visible. Regularly check in and see how your editors are doing. Are they keeping up? Is your journal delivery system keeping up with the needs and changes in scholar communication? Are you able to provide preservation? Do you have a long-term plan for managing the journal that is responsive and adaptive? And are you creating a reali realistic succession plan? This is super important and should be set up before you need it. So uh, this is not Creative Commons. This is the Claremont College's environment. Um, we're five undergraduate colleges and two graduate institutions. And we're supported by one library that serves all these institutions. Um, uh, we have eight journals. Um, open access journals, and there's been a lot of changes in the organi organizational structure of our library recently. We have a new dean. No one's job is the same as it was a year ago. We have a, a recently um, written strategic plan, and this strategic plan is uh, very supportive of publications and, you know, library publications and open access. So our journals, um, all eight of them, are open access with ties to the colleges. Uh, they're editors or librarians, they're faculty, they're undergraduates, graduate students, uh, they come from some of the institutes. Some of these journals have started decades ago in print, others are brand new and born digital, and the scope ranges from botany to humanistic mathematics, to mime, to undergraduate research, um, and to all things European Union. We do use alt metrics, but we really need to educate and promote. And we've done a imp uh, baseline impact factor for each of these journals. And so I've been working with all these journals to improve the quality, their impact and sustainable, sustainability, the quiz. Um, and in talking with other librarians, Isaac being one of them, we found that there are many of us are looking for ways to support our editors in, in improving these journals. So I should mention that, that the reason I'm not talking about what's happening at Pacific, um, other than trade secrets, is that uh, the workshop that we delivered was at Claremont. So I had the opportunity to go down and visit Allegra at Claremont, and we developed the workshop and, and presented it specifically for her faculty uh, editors. So the workshop that we developed had six kind of modules or areas of content um, that we, we thought were most relevant for addressing the issues of quality and impact and sustainability for a journal. And let me just pop over. We have a uh, guide that we put together. That's not it. Uh, this is it. So we, we put together um, a guide with some resources for, uh, to inform the workshop, uh, but also just kind of walk through the different subject areas for you. Let me just blow this up. Oh, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Links that they were talking about of um, when we put the 
slide deck there on the last slide so you can get to the side, you can get to see the other things that Debbie's talking about. Yeah, I'm just going to move this okay. down. Okay. It's always embarrassing when a librarian doesn't understand technology. I'm talking about myself. Uh, so this is the this is the guide that we put together for uh, for our, for the workshop, and we have these six kind of primary areas that we decided to cover, um, and each of them, in some way or another, addresses the issue of either quality or impact or sustainability. So, for example, um, we covered. Uh, metadata, indexing, metrics, uh, roles and responsibilities for uh, editors, editorial board members, policies for the journal, and then finally rights and copyright. Um, so for example, uh, metadata uh, can have a significant impact on uh, the quality of the journal just in its presentation, but it can also have a significant impact on the uh, sustainability of the journal over the long term, being able to uh, provide appropriate metadata um, in order for the journal to be harvested by preservation services, those sorts of things. Uh, or in the future, if the journal changes platforms, providing appropriately um, uh, coded metadata to enable it to migrate more easily be between platforms. Um, indexing and metrics um, obviously speak uh, primarily to uh, impact, and with indexing, uh, you're looking at, at the role of, of increasing the visibility of the journal and increasing the impact. Um, roles and responsibilities, we've talked a lot about um, the roles and responsibilities for journal editors, but also what they could uh, expect from their editorial board members and the different models uh, for working between editors and editorial board members. Um, and obviously that has a lot to do with sustainability and making sure that there are clear expectations for people that are uh, starting a journal uh, so that they know what they're getting into and that there are also clear expectations for how long their terms are, who's gonna take over from them, that sort of thing. Um, and you can really go right down the line. We felt that each one of these areas um, addressed either some issue of quality, impact, or sustainability, or a combination of, of them. And so we had, let's see. And in that guide, the slides that we used in the workshop are also available. So all the information and all the materials that we have in the workshop are on that page. So for the, in terms of the, the structure of the workshop, we, uh, it was a morning and afternoon workshop. We did about two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon with lunch in between. And we had a brief section for each one of those six modules and topics. And it was a fairly standard structure. We did some, a presentation um, on the topic, and this, those slides are on the, on the guide, and had an opportunity for some discussion and interaction with the editors that were there um, answering questions, clarifying things. And then at the very end of the day, at the end of the workshop, there was an opportunity for the editors to sit down and we used the DOAJ um, criteria as kind of a guide for them to walk through and think about the areas in which there might be room for development or improvement um, in their journals and identifying ways that, that they could work on those and also ways that, um, at least in this context, specifically that Allegra and the Claremont uh, libraries could help them um, improve in those areas. So I found that the challenges that we're facing at Claremont um, don't seem to be any different from what others are experiencing. So each of the journals that came to us had uh, varying needs and situations, and each of the editors that we have um, have a diverse set of skills, often very little experience, if any, of being uh, an editor. So the succession plans that were in place, if there were any, were um, really unrealistic. and. Oftentimes, I was finding that when you're the single only editor, even if you're dedicated and skilled, um, there can be burnout. And this requires a lot of work and care and feeding to keep the quality and, and impact of the journals high. So, and life gets in the way. You know, our, our editors have experienced illness, death, graduation, and there's never enough time to go around. So, moving forward, um, this workshop really helped us to recognize where we needed to improve. It, it also built a community. The, the editors were really grateful to be able to come together, and this is, you know, we, I think we were in some other session where people were talking about how it's really hard to get faculty to come um, to events at a library. We had 100% attendance, um, and they really expressed that they, they appreciated this. Uh, it grew awareness for our editors. In fact, one of our editors has become such an o open access advocate um, we've actually presented um, on open access journal uh, publishing at major math conferences. Um, there was one in Portland last year. Um, I created this next step documents to work with the, 
the editors, and these were in Google Docs, and so what we did was we pulled out the areas we needed to work on, we kind of had action plans, and we checked back and forth about our progress in this collaborative document. Um, we're also using the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication as uh, you know, one of our models, I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, and I've built an indexing spreadsheet where I polled our subject specialist to align our journals with important indexers and aggregators for their co corresponding fields, and we're working on getting all these journals indexed. Um, and we're reworking write statements and policies and beefing up the metadata, and we've created and revisited um, our, our MOUs and, and succession plans. So to close, we've um, learned that by tending our journals, uh, the quality and impact and sustainability, we hope to raise the creditability of the library publications for our institutions, as well as to dispel the myth that open access journals are not quality publications. We come up against that a lot still. Um, getting new journals off the ground has really not been our problem. It's uh, keeping them flourishing through proper care and feeding that's the challenge. So by building this community and acting on plans for improvement, we hope to overcome these challenges and publish journals that matter. So that's it for us. Go. So Karen and I are gonna talk about supporting editors uh, in a slightly different way through forming an editors group. So I work for the Ohio State University Libraries. Um, I started out working with the repository, but about three years ago switched over to being responsible for the publishing program, um, which had sort of grown up organically without, um, a lot of times there wasn't really anybody who was responsible for it. Um, things got done when somebody had time uh, and projects were taken on kind of willy-nilly. There wasn't really a lot of structure um, and nobody giving it any kind of strategic direction. So um, our, our libraries decided that the publishing program was going to be more of a strategic focus and they needed somebody to kind of kickstart it. Um, so I was asked to grow the program while um, making it more scalable and sustainable. Um, so as part of thinking about how to grow this program, um, somebody had, I don't, I don't even remember who it was, but somebody had come up with an idea of convening an editor's group for editors on campus. Uh, I was skeptical as to whether or not they would come, um, but we had our first meeting in spring of 2013, and we've met seven times since then. Uh, the group is open to anyone in the OSU community, faculty, staff, student, um, who edits a scholarly journal or really is involved or interested in scholarly journal publishing in any way. Um, as far as how, to, how we got people there, um, I tried out, I started out trying to identify all the journal editors on campus so I could reach out to them and invite them. Um, and that proved to be not just hard, but actually impossible. Uh, it turns out nobody has that information. Nobody can find that information. Um, I tried a lot of different approaches and finally just threw up my hands and um, advertised widely that we were having this meeting and just sort of waited to see who would show up. Um, at the first meeting, um, we mostly brainstormed topics for later meetings. I got them to talk about what they wanted from the group, how often they wanted to meet, that kind of logistical stuff. Um, and so since then, we've been meeting um, not quite quarterly, about three times a year. Each meeting is um, discussion-based. Uh, they each have a specific topic. And I'll usually try to either kick the meeting off with some information or, or peg somebody else to do so. Uh, either one of the editors who has a, a particular expertise or interest in the topic, um, or I'll bring in an, an outside uh, expert. Um, we had one recently that was about um, how the library decides what to buy, which is uh, of interest to journal editors. Um, so our, our head of, our collection strategist came to that and was able to answer a lot of questions. So that's the, the kind of thing that I try to do with the group. Um, the, the attendance is fairly small compared to the total number of journal editors on campus, which again, we don't know how many that is, but it's probably in the hundreds. Um, we usually get somewhere between 10 and 20. Um, our biggest meeting was when we had the provost come and talk to the editors about um, university support for journal editing, like 40 of them showed up for that, not surprisingly. Um, our smallest one was this past week. Uh, we only had two actual journal editors and a number of, of other people and I'm hoping that's just because it was right after spring break um, and doesn't show that the interest in the group is declining. Um, but as always, the, the discussion was interesting. They tend to be very involved. They tend to be um, interested and kind of grateful to have an opportunity to talk to each other. You know, journal editors usually work 
um, in solitude. Uh, they often don't have other people to um, ask advice of or compare notes on how they do their work, um, especially not people in other disciplines. That, that just almost never happens. Um, so the challenges to doing this, uh, you know, I think, I was hoping that the editors would kind of take this group and run with it as far as um, interacting outside of meetings on the listserv, um, being a little more proactive as far as, you know, saying, hey, this is what we want to talk about, this is what we want to do with the group. Um, they're, they're engaged, but they're also very passive, so it has really fallen to me to um, come up with topics, make sure that there's somebody to get the ball rolling, um, sometimes facilitate discussion depending on, on how, who's there and how it's going. So, you know, I think I have this, this constant fear that I'm going to run out of interesting things for them to talk about um, or pick one that's a total dud. Um, so, you know, I think at some point I'm going to have to do another brainstorming session with them to try to get a new list of topics because we've pretty much run out of the ones they came up with at the first meeting. Um, but, you know, they keep showing up, so apparently they're, they continue to find it valuable. Um, so again, I, I introduced this as saying that I was looking at ways to do outreach for our publishing program. Um, the editor's group is not outreach in any direct sense. I don't use it as a venue to talk about um, library publishing or our publishing program. Uh, every now and then, if it's relevant, I might say something. Um, some of our journal publishing partners do come to the editor's group, but most of the members are not people who work with us on publishing. Um, it serves as, as outreach in a subtle kind of way in that you know, more people now know that the library does publishing uh, and that kind of slow trickling word of mouth outreach um, we find to be one of the more effective things at a place the size of Ohio State. Um, and it also it, it is a way for me to kind of showcase another part of the library's publishing program which is not what was handed to me as the strategic direction of growing the program, growing the numbers, getting more journals. Um, but rather a focus on education and consulting and these kinds of um, kind of quick but high impact um, activities around publishing that really fill a need on campus when people don't frequently don't know who to talk to. They don't know who to ask if they have questions about um, they're thinking about starting a journal or they're getting pressure from their editorial board to go up open access and they don't know what that means. Um, so having the editor's group is another venue for people to start seeing the library as a source of expertise for those things. So we're going to keep doing it for as long as it makes sense. And I'm going to hand it over to Karen. Great. Thanks a lot. I almost want to just say ditto and open it up for questions because um, Melanie, Melanie's experience is she's farther along um, in, the, in her roundtable than UNT is, but um, it sounds like she's having a lot of the same experiences that I and Kevin are. Um, that said, I'm going to return to my um, written remarks and go ahead and read my read, read what I was going to read. And uh, apologies if I repeat some of what Melanie has said. Um, so first of all, I'm Karen Devinney. I'm the managing editor, assistant director at the University of North Texas Press. Uh, UNT Press was founded in 1987. We published our first book in 1989, and I've been there since 1999. With a staff of four, we publish 15 to 20 new books, plus reprints, plus four journals and counting a year. Our books are published simultaneously in print and in any ebook e platform that will have them. Um, it took us a long time to get uh, our arrangement made with for Kindle, but we're, we're out everywhere that publishes ebooks. Um, I do all the copy editing and some of the acquisitions and about two-thirds of the typesetting. The rest of the design and typesetting is contracted out by freelancers. Um, our other staff are the director who does the remaining acquisitions. Uh, we have a marketing manager who handles promotions and marketing, and our admin assistant who handles the finances supervised by the director. We're distributed by the Texas Book Consortium, uh, which is based at Texas A&M University Press in College Station. Uh, from our founding until 2010, we reported to the provost. In 2010, we were moved to a reporting relation with the libraries. And we've been encouraged since then to collaborate on open access initiatives and, and in the last couple of years on library publishing, um, especially since Kevin Hawkins joined the libraries last year as director of library publishing. 
UNT, the university, is one of the founding institutions of the LPC, mainly through the good work of our Dean of Libraries, Martin Halbert, who was sitting right there in his somewhere else right now. Um, I've really enjoyed working with Kevin because I have to say that I'm really curious about why libraries want to get into publishing. Um, everybody realizes it's not for the money. Um, Long-time university presses have been going belly up for about the last 10 years with regularity, uh, precisely because there's no money in publishing books. Um, one of the reasons there's no money in publishing books is because library acquisitions funds have decreased. So it's especially interesting that libraries want to get into an endeavor that doesn't really raise money. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, uh, open access is an important mission, and libraries are very well positioned to encourage open access. And also, I think, in a broader level, um, publishing is a logical extension of your traditional mission, preserving, disseminating knowledge, in the broadest sense that, that uh, can be extended into publishing. So it makes a certain amount of sense that libraries and traditional presses can work together and collaborate and find common ground, which is what we're trying to do at UNT. Uh, one of the ways that we're doing that is by creating um, an editor's roundtable. Kevin and I are co-chairing it. It's only about a six months old or so. We've met twice. Um, the purpose of the roundtable is to collect any editors on campus um, who are interested and discuss common issues and discuss um, best practices. We've, uh, we've only met twice, as I said. We offer lunch as an incentive um, that probably will stop being necessary because so far the response has been quite enthusiastic. Um, there are 10 projects that we are aware of on campus with relevant ed editors on campus. They range from traditional journals such as Studies in the Novel and American Political Science Review to some student publications. Um, there's a new endeavor by our College of Music to publish books um, of jazz charts from our music library. Uh, UNT has a fairly famous big band jazz program and we have some terrific, th uh, terrific things in, our, in those archives. Uh, also, the students at UNT can make some money selling their charts. So far, none of these is open access that I'm aware of. Um, UNT Press publishes a couple of journals uh, with the College of Music that are uh, initially subscription and then they go open access after, I think, two years, something like that. But those are established journals that have long-time subscriptions uh, and, and subscribers, and so they're, they're not open access originally. Um, for many of the editors who have attended, it's been a revelation that so many of their colleagues are involved in similar projects. That's been one very, very useful uh, thing about the round, round table. They've been bonding experiences, um, not to say bitch and wine sessions. They've also been learning experiences, especially, especially the discussion on copyright, which was our most recent meeting. Um, many of the editors had taken over established journals and had just pretty much done what their predecessors had done. They didn't have a real understanding of the responsibilities of their authors to get permissions. They weren't really um, cognizant of the repercussions of their author agreements. Uh, I think that the round table on, on uh, that we held on sort of issues of copyright and permissions was very eye-opening for some of them. Uh, they also didn't realize that UNT has a liaison on campus expressly available to answer these sorts of questions at, at the library. We have somebody, we have a director of scholarly communications who, with a law degree, and she's perfectly happy to address these issues with editors. Uh, Kevin himself has also been very helpful explaining things like uh, Creative Commons licenses. This was completely new to me. I've never had to deal with them as a book publisher. The editors were not the only ones to learn a lot from the roundtables, that's for sure. My own con contribution to the roundtable has been to give editorial and production advice because that's my background. I'm very good at cracking the whip on authors, for instance. Um, and we also, like Melanie's uh, editor's group, 
uh, we're trying to fly the flag of our press and also from the Library Publishing Services Office. Uh, it's relatively new at UNT and we want people to know about us. So although it's new, I'm hoping that the roundtable as it develops will allow and encourage a sort of collaboration that has been a theme of this forum. Uh, are there ways these editors can pool their resources? Uh, it seems to me that probably the most likely way that this might happen would be through technology, um, rather than through subject specific skills like editing. That's kind of been the discussion here. I don't hear a lot of discussion of subject specific knowledge or sub subject specific editing at this conference, but I hear a lot of discussion of technology, software, web platforms, that sort of thing that people can really work together across subjects on. Uh, so we'll see what happens in the future with our roundtable. But uh, so far, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun, actually. <laughs>